Hello, and welcome to IRI Growth Insights, featuring IRI thought leaders, industry partners, and guests. For more than 40 years, IRI has been known for its invaluable data, but these podcasts delve into the insights the data reveal to fuel market disruption and market growth for those in the CPG, retail, healthcare, and media markets. I'm your host, Joan Driggs, coming to you from IRI's corporate headquarters in Chicago. I'm honored to be speaking with Sally Lyons-Wyatt, a recognized thought leader in the CPG and retail industries, and a frequent keynote speaker and an authority on consumer eating and shopping trends. As an executive and practice leader for IRI's Client Insights Division, Sally is responsible for driving integrated initiatives as well as measuring their success within consumer strategy, consumer and customer insights, media, and personalization practice areas. Sally is an avid traveler, and she considers trips through the retail stores to be among her favorite journeys. Today, we're going to be talking about the impact e-commerce is having on impulse purchases, most notably snacking. Welcome, Sally. Hi, Joan. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining me. So, Sally, do we need to write an obituary for impulse purchases? No, no, we don't. In fact, impulse and even planned purchases are alive and well, but there really is an evolution. Um, If I just take a step back and talk about snacking in general, snacking continues to outpace food and beverage. um, And that's the second year running. And we also have seen increased frequency. 47% of consumers eat three plus snacks per day. And those the types of trends that we're seeing, we're, we do believe that there will be an increase of $16 billion of incremental growth over the next five years. So part of that is still a large part is impulse. But we do feel that consumers have gone from two ways that they purchase and consume snacks to four. So what is driving some of these changes in how we're snacking? Is it specific consumers? Is it what's available? What's changing? That's like a chicken and the egg question Um, because it's actually both. So what we've seen is the younger generation has fundamentally changed how they are eating throughout the day. So they started to change the paradigm of three square meals a day and a couple of snacks to eating more frequently, smaller portions throughout the day, snack portions throughout the day, And some of that was just their lifestyle. And some of it was listening to nutritionists and dietitians on how to really accelerate your metabolism, get more out of your day, be better for your, you know, the health of your um, body. And so you started to see, as we've been doing snacking trends for a very long time, we started to see millennials change that. And we started to see the number of snacks per day increasing. And part of the reason why we're going to, we projected that $16 billion growth is because millennials are starting to, sh- to indicate that they are taking their eating habits with them as they age. That is a tailwind. And that tailwind is bringing a very large generation forward, eating more frequently throughout the day. And our first, just, just, we're really too early to say it, but it does, there are indicators that say that Gen Z will be eating similarly. So you have two very large generations that are going to be pushing this, you know, snack consumption throughout the day at a higher level than their preceding generations that we saw. And that makes sense. I mean, um, that these younger generations are not only changing or redefining how we're snacking, but we also see that um, they're the ones driving a lot of the e-commerce purchases too across their whole purchasing lifestyle. It is true. It's funny because around six years ago, I was sitting in the office of a CEO of a large snack food company. And this CEO asked me, will e-commerce kill my impulse business? And at that point, it was a little too early to tell, but I did say that I didn't think it was going to kill impulse, but that we really, it was too early to really understand the impact that this new channel would have 
on retailing in general, not just impulse. Um, and that, but yet we knew it would all evolve and we knew impulse would evolve. But at that point, we weren't sure if impulse was going to be suggested selling or something more. So I've been looking at that for the last six years. And what I've come to find is that really and truly impulse is alive and well. But what's fascinating is that because of the new channels like e-commerce online and some new specialty channels, impulse has fundamentally changed. So traditionally, you would have had impulse as consumers who are physically in the store and that they see something that wasn't on their list or they hadn't planned to to buy. Um, And they decide to buy something in an instant because they either wanted it or they felt like, oh, I forgot I needed it. This could happen to almost any product in the store, but it's very prevalent with snacking. And this phenomenon of wanting something that's not on your list is something that we're actually seeing as well as online um, as part of the subscription service or automatic replenishment option. But it's really changed. Online, digital, and social have really fragmented impulse into traditional impulse and on-demand. And on-demand is the third way in which we see consumers shopping and consuming food. On-demand is primarily driven by technology. And so, for example, if you want a snack, you can just get on your phone or computer and order one for delivery via Grubhub, Uber Eats, or even some retailers can quickly deliver snacks wherever you are. I actually saw a commercial by Uber Eats that stated in the commercial as the driver, you know, delivery guy was getting off of his motorcycle saying your midnight snack is here. Um, so, you know, you see those different examples. Yeah. In fact, I, um, I think it's Burger King is actually delivering snacks in traffic. If you're stuck in traffic. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. Well, there you go. That's on demand at its finest. Um, we've also, you know, you think about going to the movie and, you, if you want to order a snack, you can order ahead. That's on demand. If you're taking a flight and you want to have snacks, you can order ahead. That's on demand. On demand is that third way, and it should be part of any organization's strategic plan because it's not going to go away and it's definitely going to drive um, increased sales. Right. And I think that retailers, you know, are still struggling with things like, um, their e-commerce platforms, click and collect platforms. So does Impulse have a place there, like with click and collect? You know, I think it does. And I think that's a great question because with, with click and collect, there's a couple of interruption points, if you will, to potentially get that unplanned purchase. Whether that's suggestive selling, and I can tell you as a consumer of online, um, especially grocery shopping. Sometimes it'll give me a suggestion on, hey, people that bought this have also bought that because you know you're preparing a meal or something. So there's that. But there's also, hey, in the past you bought this and noticed it, and it is it isn't in your basket. And those types of suggestions have prompted me to buy something that I didn't intend on buying. So I think that's there. But I also think Click and Collect presents a new opportunity for when the consumer is driving up to pick up their groceries. And for retailers that can really leverage technology, there may be a way to say, hi, Ms. lyons Wyatt. we noticed that you um, might need to, you didn't order this. Perhaps you want to put that in your basket. We've got some here. Would you like it? The answer would be, oh my goodness, thank you so much. Yes. And that's another way to get an impulse sale. Right. I do think I want to just add to that, too, at the ordering area. Um, You know, Amazon probably perfected it with books, but now we see that, oh, you've ordered these things. People who have ordered these things are also ordering X or, you know, you might be interested in that as well. So kind of aligned with um, what you've ordered in the past, but also making recommendations, which I always appreciate. Yeah, you and me both. And then, and as I mentioned earlier, so we've gone from list and impulse to this list, impulse, and on demand. But there is one more way that I feel consumers are purchasing and consuming foods and snack foods, and that is experiential. Experiential, in my mind, is broken into two parts. One is where you're buying, and the second one is your consumption. 
So let's start with where you buy. Um, experiential is almost a must for the younger generation. And we always had candy stores. Like seems like since the inception of retail, there was a candy store of some sort. And when those traditional stores were there, they would have had candy in bulk. They would have had a variety of candies. And it was just a, it was a treasure hunt type of um, engagement. What we've seen and transpire is that those candy stores have turned more into mini amusement parks like a candy topia, where you're really engaging in different areas of the store. Right. Yeah. Chicago has um, Dylan's Candy Bar. So similar. It is. I mean, we went up there with my kids and they had them playing games and it was very interactive. So that's exactly that's exactly um, the type of experiential. But there's stores even like Primistry, which allures consumers to come into the store because you can watch them make ice cream using liquid nitrogen. Um, and it's you're getting your customized ice cream made right before you. It's a very cool experience. Um, and so we've seen that. So how are you seeing like other types of retail outlets, um, you know, maybe more of our traditional CPG outlets kind of play in that space? You know, I recently noticed a few different variations, which I think are fascinating. One is 7-Eleven actually opened up a concept store out in a suburb of Dallas. And the store is an emphasis um, on experience and experiential. So there's a coffee bar and beer tap. There's also fresh and hot snack food selections and other beverage and food selections. Um, and then I just saw in the last week where Walgreens is going to be using wing aviation drones um, and be the first retailer to test on-demand drone delivery service and food, snacks, and beverages are going to be part of that. That is definitely going to be on demand, but it's definitely going to be experiential as well. Yeah, those are huge, big moves. For sure. Um, but experiential is not only about where you buy, but it's also about consumption of products. Um, and you may have seen some, Joan, even with when you think about experiential type opportunities in consuming snack foods. Oh, right. I mean, you know, uh, Larry Levin and I um, work on new product pace setters and experiential was one of the big themes um, that we looked at this, this past year. In fact, the number one product, the number one pace setter product was Kinder Joy's um, egg, the little eggs where it's part toy, you know, you crack it open and half of it is a toy and half of it is this little delectable chocolate treat. Very interactive, very engaging, um, very experiential. That's a perfect one. And you see that these consumers are loving the different textorial because even within that egg, the hazelnut has a little bit of crunch in it. And that that experience, that textorial taste is something that we're seeing consumers like. We've seen it also with Doritos Blaze, where it was introduced and when you eat one, it gets hotter over time. Um, I even say, have seen an ice cream that has a deer tracks is the name of the flavor. And there's candy inside of the ice cream to enhance the eating experience. Oh, I've seen so many crazy ice creams with things like um, pop rocks in them or the chilies kind of maybe not the same to the extreme of Doritos, but um, definitely like a heat associated with something that's very traditionally cold. Um, yeah. So super crazy things happening just with ice cream alone. But, you know, Sally, even kind of like those to me are interesting products, kind of a little bit out there. One of the things I noticed recently, I think it was just announced recently, Kraft Heinz, which, you know, legacy brands, is doing something really interesting with a package for Kraft American Singles. They're making it more interactive both in the store where you can just use your phone, not a QR code, but use your phone to like look at uh, recipes and things like that. But then also when you get home, you know, you can use it similarly again to like play kind of a scratch off game for sweepstakes. Um, just so interesting that it's the package is being part of that entertainment and education as well. 
I think that that's the new frontier. So when we were at the Sweets and Snacks Expo, we saw treats and snacks both leveraging augmented reality to provide that experience with the product. So I think that is something um, that several food servers, like I believe Domino's, partnered with Snapchat and used their augmented reality lenses and really to get consumers engaged. I think that you're going to see far more of that. And yet again, that falls into experiential. Right. I think, you know, I know with Domino's, um, kind of the hook is that you can watch your pizza being made. You can watch it, you know, through its entire pizza journey right to your door. And I think that eventually that's going to play in a lot bigger as we look to transparency around ingredients and sustainability, um, that augmented reality has a huge, a huge play there as well. 100% agree. Um, but what's interesting about this evolution, although everything we've talked about is very exciting and there is a lot of growth, traditional retail doesn't necessarily have the lock on all of the path to, to purchase from a consumer standpoint. In fact, within our 2019 snacking survey, we found that 45% of consumers go to, um, to quick serve and limited serve one to two times per week to get their snack. And that's even higher percentages in the younger generation. So there is this call to action, if you will, um, because we see that the units are slowing at traditional retail, which is just yet another indicator that, hey, hey snacking frequency is up. We see the dollars growing, but yet at the same time, units slowing. It's an indicator that we have a call to action that we need to do more from the manufacturing and retailer community to, to capture more online impulse, experiential, and on-demand um, sales. So the majority of companies who we work with are definitely in that space. You know, the more traditional retail, um, CPG manufacturers. So what are some of the opportunities or where are some of the, the places that they can play a little bit better? They can respond better to both impulse and even snacking, if you will. But let's just focus kind of on impulse and, and the consumer. I think innovation that we just talked about is the first area as, as an innovation is going to be from the manufacturer side and on the retailer side. So have you seen the industry evolve? Um, innovation is going to be critical to keep consumers in CBG, not necessarily going to quick serve limited serve to get their snacking, but within traditional retail. So innovation, like what we've been sharing today, and I think future innovation that really does tap into the um, ability to, for on-demand, look at packaging, seeing if there's something that if it is going to be delivered by drone, do you have the right package for that? Um, when you think about um, any type of on-demand venue, do you have distribution there? If not, you need to innovate to get there. Um, from store formats, I've seen recently Kroger, Safeway, and some other retailers that are opening up in urban areas. Their stores are more engaging, more experiential. I think that expansion is going to help the industry because it's going to uh, allow for these snack foods to be closer to the consumer and interrupt them on their way, potentially to a quick serve or limited serve. You know, you just said something that I think is so important, and that is interrupting them on their way. Um, you know, I know Ulta, for example, is doing a really impressive job of like lo location-based targeting. Um, but I think how retailers communicate with shoppers and build those big relationships is going to be so important to tapping into that, that huge, like 16 billion in incremental growth that you talked about. And I think what you just mentioned as far as uh, the ability to interrupt with the right messaging, that personalization, I think that's going to evolve. But I also think traditional tactics are going to evolve. So price is still probably going to be, you know, king. But then after that, what influence will social digital have? How can you really refine your messaging um, to, to interrupt those consumers, no matter where they are on their journey, to maybe do something different to attack impulse 
at the heart of it, right? To quickly give them an idea that's going to entice them to buy your product or go to your store. Right. Well, that's a great place to close. Um, You mentioned Sally again, there's lots of incremental growth to be had. And I think that we've brought um, the attention to a lot of interesting ideas that companies, uh, retailers and manufacturers alike can tap into. So thanks, Sally. Thanks, Joan. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for listening. Please become a subscriber and let us know what you want to learn more about. We'll serve it up in a future IRI Growth Insights episode. Look for us wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to review IRI Growth Insights. Also, visit us on the web at iriworldwide.com and connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn.